And now I would like to uh, introduce Sharon. Sharon is the Horticulture Project Assistant for Douglas County and as part of that role manages the Douglas County Extension Master Gardeners. Sharon has formal academic training as an ecologist, but seat of the pants training as a horticulturist. Thankfully, she can apply both passions to native plant gardening. Sharon is also a freelance science writer and recently co-authored the book, Waiting Right In, Discovering the Nature of Wetlands. Take it away, Sharon. Okay, hello everybody, welcome. Zoom is great when it's cold and snowy and blowy out. So um, this uh, works well in this situation. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, thank you for that introduction, Lynn. Uh, I am here to talk about planting natives in Northeast Kansas, and I am the program manager for the Douglas County Master Gardeners. So hello, everybody in Johnson County. Uh, we are getting ready to get going here in Douglas County. You know, everybody's already talking about committee meetings and everything, so I'm sure you all are doing the same thing over in Johnson County. Uh, planting natives uh, is something that allows me to combine both my passions for ecology and gardening. I don't have any formal training as a horticulturist, but I learned from all the master gardeners and I've learned from being in this position and I have learned from planting in my own landscape. So my uh, training and passion is in restoration ecology. So I have been working throughout the years uh, to help restore prairies in this part of the country. And I also did some work up in Wisconsin for that. Uh, so I'm becoming more and more familiar. There's always something to learn. And what I've discovered is over the last several years that native planting natives has become more and more popular. Uh, we get calls in at the office all the time about people either wanting to tuck a few natives into their landscape, their traditional landscape, or uh, reconstructing whole prairies or restoring prairies. And we do get those calls into the office. And there's a number of organizations in Kansas that help landowners do that. And of course, the master gardeners can help um, more the smaller scale landowner uh, suburban, urban houses, trying to put um, natives into their own landscapes. So the interest has been increasing. And so towards the end of this public, uh, towards the end of this presentation, I'll, I'll take you through our, our guide for this. What we've done is we've put together a lot of resources in one place. Because if you go online and you look for information on native plants, as you may have found out, there's tons of information out there. Um, but they're from different states. Um, you might find a planting list in one source. You might find how to plant an, from another source. And you might find information from Oregon and Wisconsin and Mississippi and all these places. Um, so there's an overwhelming amount of information. But what we're trying to do is bring it all together and what's relevant for here in this part of the country for us. So, um, but we're going to uh, start with um, some definitions and uh, first, and we'll go through what a native plant is and some benefits and concerns about planting them. So I should be able to forward my slide here. There it goes. Okay, so first of all, how does one define a native plant? Let's make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So here's a plant that many of you might recognize, um, Laetris aspera, okay, one of the, the gay feathers. And this plant is something we would define as native to Eastern Kansas. So it's a, probably familiar in your own gardens or out in the landscape. Okay, here's another plant. Uh, this one is Penstemon albidus. And you probably haven't seen this one around unless you know somebody who's deliberately planted this. And that's because it's a native, it's native to Kansas, but it's native to Western Kansas. It likes that drier environment. So you wouldn't typically see it in Eastern Kansas. Now here's something most people are probably very familiar with, the yellow foxtail. Uh, and it's everywhere, you see it all around. So you might think it's native, but it's actually considered uh, naturalized. Um, and this is a non-native plant who has been made very comfortable in its uh, introduced surroundings. It needs no help from humans to reproduce and spread. 
Um, it came over from Eurasia um, and it's found this environment very, very good for itself and it, and it does fine and it grows in many, many places. It's what we consider naturalized, but it is non-native. Now here's something um, some of you might be familiar with. This is purple loosestrife, a lithrum. And while there are many natives of this plant, this one here came from, it's native to around Czechoslovakia or what used to be Czechoslovakia, um, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And it's a wetland invader. This one is a non-native plant, but it has become problematic. So it's a, it's a category of non-native where it has risen to the level that when it enters a plant community, it's disruptive of that plant community. So it's considered invasive. It kind of takes over. And this one, um, you'll probably all be very familiar with, field bindweed. Um, it is also in a special category of non-natives. This, this one is considered noxious. And noxious is a legal definition. So there are a number of noxious, there's a noxious weed list for each state. And uh, field bindweed is on the Kansas noxious weed list. list. And this is something that has uh, been so, become so problematic um, that it's disruptive mostly to agricultural settings, which is why it's on a, a special legal list with the Department of Agriculture. And landowners are required to try to control this. Lespedeza is another one that's a noxious weed. Um, that you might be familiar with um, that is disruptive to agricultural systems. So I'm gonna show you a few definitions and some commonalities of definitions um, of native plants because you do encounter different definitions of native. So here's one from the American Gardener. Uh, native plants should be defined as those that have evolved and adapted to a specific location. And that is something that is repeated in various different kinds of phrases throughout definitions of what a native plant is or is not. So here's another one where you see the same theme. Plant species actually native to an eco-region where it's evolved in concert with soils, climate, and fauna. And that's the key thing to the native plants. And one of the reasons why I'll talk about in a minute why they're so beneficial is they are actually adapted to this environment. Um, they have evolved with the insects and the climate and the rainfall amounts. I just want to show you this definition from the Natural Resources Conservation Service because it has a piece in the definition that's very important when talking about natives. And the word native, whenever you claim a plant is native, you should always um, use a geographic qualifier with that. Uh, because as I showed at the beginning when you had the uh, Leatris, which is native to Eastern Kansas, and the pensamen native to Western Kansas, that's very important when you're trying to talk about planting natives is where actually, what region of the country has it evolved in, in concert with climate and soils. And so even though the pensamen might be native to Kansas, you might have a little bit more difficulty growing it in Eastern Kansas. And the same with the Leatris aspera, it might be more difficult to grow it in Western Kansas if it's not adapted to those conditions. So a geographic qualifier is helpful. There are some people who want very, very specific natives to really where, where, where we are here in native Kansas, uh, Northeast Kansas, um, but there are, but, and, and don't want any other kind of plant. Um, and there are those that will borrow from, you know, there's some plants we plant from, you know, the Southeast part of the state. And of course, we always borrow a little bit for our shady areas, we borrow from Missouri um, for their native plants, even though they might not technically be native um, to Kansas. So it helps to have that geographic qualifier. So I have a poll here for everybody, if you can do it. So a poll for why is it, if you've planted natives or are interested in planting natives, uh, why? So do we have any results coming up with why people plant natives? 82% of participants have um, answered so far. We'll give about okay. 10 more seconds here. Mm -hmm. I can talk about why I, I plant natives is one is because of, uh, mostly because uh, they're less fuss than most things. Uh, I, I like to 
plant a plant and then uh, not have to worry about it too much. That's kind of my thing. And I find uh, the pollinators that visit them fascinating, even though I don't know how to identify most of the pollinators, I do enjoy them. I like the fact that my yard um, attracts all kinds of birds and butterflies. Oh, and that looks like pollinator support is the number one thing. Great. And I did force you to choose one or the other just to see, because uh, if I had put all of the above, a lot of people would have done that, choose, chosen that one. But it's good to see where people are in terms of why they're planting uh, natives. So pollinator support is the one. So we're going to go through, um, thank you all, go through, through some of these reasons for why we plant natives. Oops, I'm trying to forward my presentation here. There it goes. All right, so native pollinators, that was the number one. And I love this poster of bees uh, because it, to me, the first time I saw it, it was just astounding just how many types of bees there are. And it's something that I have become more and more familiar with um, as uh, in my position with extension here and all the gardens that I visit. Uh, it's just astounding how many pollinators visit. And of course, we've just got the bees here. Um, there's moths and butterflies and flies and beetles and uh, our native plants um, support our native pollinators. Um, we're experiencing, unfortunately, great uh, decline in our native insect species and particularly our native bees and native plants are, are around to support them. Uh, so this is where they get their nutrition from is the native plants. Now, some species are very generous and are as happy uh, with non-natives as natives. And we'll talk about that in just a moment because there is, I wanna talk a little bit about the research that's being done with pollinators. So I don't want people to forget about, most people associate uh, native pollinators with the flowering, uh, you know, going to the flowering plants. Um, but I do wanna remind everybody that grasses um, also support um, our native pollinators. So this, I found this list from the University of Minnesota, which is just fascinating. So just on little blue stem, one of our native grasses, look at all these moths and skippers and butterflies that the caterpillar species, the caterpillar um, of the moths and butterflies feed on. I mean, this is just astounding how little blue stem can support all this. There's uh, native sedges where there are moths and skippers that are absolutely dependent upon sedges because that's the only plant they'll lay their eggs on. So we, we have to think about the whole life cycle of the insects. So we're not just looking at the blooming parts of plants when we think about supporting insects. So an, one of the other major reasons that people are looking to plant native plants um, are because of the maintenance issues, low maintenance. And I, I can't emphasize this enough, and um, all our master gardeners emphasize this when they give programs, is there's no such thing as no maintenance. Um, a lot of people are calling, I wanna plant native plants because I, then I don't have to worry about it all. Now, so, and I like that aspect of planting native plants, but it's low maintenance, not no maintenance. So, and why is that? That has to do because they, those, these plants are adapted to our local conditions. They can handle what Kansas can throw at them. They've grown up here, you know, their species have grown up here. And so when we throw at these wild temperature differences um, and then one year really drought and then the next year really wet, um, our native plants can handle this for the most part. So, um, so they're heat and drought tolerant. They're tolerant of what we might consider our poor soils, but to those plants, a lot of our prairie plants, um, this isn't poor soil for them. They struggle, our native plants struggle when we put them out in our gardens and we've got all this compost and mulch and we baby them and we water them. That's when they struggle is actually when they are put in a situation where they're, it's, it's happy for a lot of our non-native plants. And of course, all this, when they're adapted to, to the environment, they need less water and no fertilizer. Um, and we don't want to spray pesticides on our native plants because we want the insects to use them. So from a sustainability aspect, there's a great deal, num great number of reasons to plant our native plants. Sharon, 
Yes. Uh, would you like the first question? It's yes. how, far, how far will a caterpillar travel to get to a food source? Well, I don't have a, a technical um, answer to that. I don't know. I do know just from personal observation that they can actually go a lot faster than one thinks. Um, if you watch your monarch caterpillars go, they can move um, from one plant to the next in pretty short order, um, as can the tomato hornworm uh, move pretty fast. Uh, but in general, um, I don't know um, the answer to that question, how fast. It will depend on the species and how much food there is for the, for the caterpillar. Thanks. Uh, let's see. So uh, I do have another poll coming up. I'm curious. So you might have heard the term. So we talk about natives, but there's this other term that's thrown around called native var. So uh, I just have a real short poll here uh, for defining a native var just to see where we stand. So what is a native var? Is it a cultivar of a native plant? A native plant cultivated in a greenhouse? or a division of a native perennial plant. And there's a lot of discussion um, happening around the topic of nativars. And I, I hate to use the word should, but that's, you know, should we plant nativars as opposed to natives? So this is actually a big topic in The world of planting natives. And we'll talk about that and certainly if you have any questions about that. So do we have um, any results for this? Here, ah yes, okay great. So a cultivar of a native plant. So most people are familiar with what a cultivar and that's all a native R is, is a cultivar, uh, a native plant that's been manip manipulated for one trait or another. Uh, so for one for some advantageous, whether it be form, color, and we'll look at some of the, those that are available. So for instance, whoops, it always seems to delay, there we go. Cultivar of a native plant. So it's been manipulated by selective breeding or cross breeding to highlight a desirable trait and the thing about cultivars uh, that I'll discuss a little bit further is that they're mostly propagated through cloning as opposed to seed. And how you know whether something is a, is a native R or a cultivar of a native plant is by looking at the plant tag. So you may see coneflower on the plant tag. And what you'll notice there is that little X and then in the, the single quotes, another name for the echinacea, which is the genus of coneflower. And that shows you, that tells you that this is a cultivar, some kind of hybrid of the native cone flower uh, with another flower um, to give you this white cone flower. And here's another one called white swan it is. The first one is called snow cone. Um, the next one is called white swan. And when you look at the packet or the tag, you'll be able to see that something is a cultivar. If you didn't already notice that, huh, I've never seen a, a white cone flower before. So there are all kinds of varieties. I picked echinacea because there are all kinds of cultivars of echinacea. So we'll look at some pictures of some of them. So here's another version of a white one. Um, here's one with some funky blooms on it. And they apparently this has been a very, very popular thing to do with cone flowers. So all these different kinds of double blooms as these are called, these puffy things are double blooms. And then of course, which this one looks very lovely uh, in terms of the different colors. And all of these, all of these have been hybridized and raised from there are our very common Echinacea purpurea in this case. Uh, so that's what the native type looks like. And it's been manipulated to give all these other different forms of Echinacea that people like for one reason or another. So what are some of the benefits of the native R's versus the concerns? So for benefits, um, the traits manipulated are color. We like lots of different colors in our, 
in our uh, landscape when we see that really bright orange or that really bright red, we're attracted to that. Um, so we often manipulate for color. We also manipulate for height. It is a great thing to find dwarfs of your favorite plants, especially if you live on a lot. I live on a little city lot in Lawrence and a lot of the natives um, are just too big um, for my lot. So I like to find the dwarf varieties. Um, and of course, style and size of bloom, those double blooms are really popular. Um, and of course, if uh, you're familiar with the hybrid hybrids of our vegetable crops, we often are hybridizing for disease resistant and, and the size and quality of fruit. Another benefit of the, the cultivars of the natives, the native ours, is they're often more available than our straight natives. So uh, often when you go, you find those plant tags, they often have um, a, a cultivar name on them. It's a still somewhat difficult to find a wide, wide variety of true natives. So our native ours are more available in the garden stores. Now, some of the concerns about planting native ours and the debate surrounding um, natives versus native ours um, have to do with one, um, genetic diversity. So I mentioned that most of our cultivars and native ours are produced by clones, uh, by cloning plants. And what that does, if all the population of a particular species is from a clone and has the exact same genetic diversity, same, same DNA, um, that can be a problem if there is an invasive insect, a disease that hits that population. I like to think of genetic diversity in terms of an insurance policy. Um, if you have some genetic variety in a population of plants, you're more likely to find individuals that are resistant to an insect or to a disease that will survive that invasion of the insect or the disease. So genetic diversity is like an insurance policy. So there is some concern with dampening genetic diversity by planting so many clones of a particular variety of a plant. Um, another concern is, although we don't have a lot of uh, scientific research on this topic quite yet, is there's been some concern about the quality of the nectar, the amount of the nectar that's found in native ours versus the natives, and the nutrition of the seeds and the plant matter. Uh, we just don't really know enough yet. They were just starting to do the research on this. One thing that has been shown is there's some indication uh, of change in leaf chemistry when you go from, when you manipulate the natives. Um, people really like those purple leaves, a purple tinge to the leaf now. You might've seen that in maybe the penstemon or other uh, native ours. And there's some indication that insects don't get the nutrition from those leaves or are actually uh, don't feed on the purple leaves as much as the green leaves. And you may think, well, that's a great thing, right? Um, I don't have insects feeding on my leaves, but when we're planting natives, we're trying to support the bugs and the insects. So we want them, we want munched plants. When you plant natives, you have to have a certain tolerance for munched plants because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to support um, the insect po population. Um, so if you have leaf chemistry that's been altered that doesn't allow the caterpillars um, to maybe uh, feed as much on the plant, then that's actually a problem. Uh, there has been research done on pollination visits to natives versus native ours, and we're just getting started in the science of this. Uh, and so, so far, really it's been mixed results on how, on pollinators visiting natives and non-natives. It's a real mixed bag. So there's no way I can say definitively that there, uh, a garden of native plants is going to support more pollinators than a garden purely of non-natives. You can't say that yet. The research is ongoing. Uh, one thing that can be said is that the double blooms, these flowers here on the right um, side of the screen, right, um, right lower corner, the double blooms, those seem to be problematic for pollinators. They're just not structured right for the um, pollinator tongue parts um, to feed and get nectar from. So that ten, tends to be a problem for the um, 
for the pollinators. But the, the jury is still out and there's doing a lot of investigation now on what plants actually bring in more pollinators. Um, so let's take a look at some, what I'm calling some native uh, equivalents. So we have our traditional landscapes and people call and they ask about what they can plant instead, like plant, what native can they plant instead? And um, if you don't know, um, Applied Ecological Services has a native nursery uh, based in Baldwin uh, and they sell a lot of uh, native plants and they have some suggested equivalents. Um, Grow Native um, out of Missouri also has some suggested equivalents, but let's take a look at some of these equivalents of natives. So a still bee is a very common um, plant around here that we plant non-native. Um, and the equivalent that's suggested is the foam flower here on the right. Uh, and so you can judge you know, for yourself whether you think that's truly an equivalent or not. It has a similar white spray of blossoms. The leaves are different. Um, but the thing about the foam flower is it can spread really rapidly. And that's often a concern with some of our natives uh, is how they can spread. And that's something you do have to watch out for. It's the same with non-natives, um, but you can not expect to put any native in your ground and expect it to behave just because it's native. It might behave far too well. Let's take another look at one. Another one, Forsythia. Of course, that first yellow spray um, in the spring, people like that. So what can I plant instead of this Forsythia? Well, there's witch hazel, which is native. It's a uh, witch hazel, the Ozark native, um, at least close by. Uh, that has actually, it's blooms, as you can see in the upper right, don't quite match if you really want that pop of yellow, that wow of yellow from a forsythia. So what plant breeders have done is they've taken that native and manipulated the color of the blossom and they've come up with this witch hazel. So witch hazel itself, a species is native to the general region. Um, and they developed a cultivar of that called Arnold's Promise, which has that sort of pop of yellow. So if you're looking for that. So there's an example of wanting to go native, but not really being able to find an exact substitute. Um, here's another one, uh, the miscanthus grasses um, that are very popular, and then uh, a native grass, um, Indian grass. Now I have to, this is one of these cautionary tales where if you're planting that Indian grass in your nutrient rich garden, along with all your other plants that you water and you compost and you mulch, it's going to be a problem. I just spent um, all a good chunk of last summer digging out native grasses, um, switchgrass in particular, and this Indian grass out of our demonstration gardens here on the fairgrounds in Douglas County. I cannot recommend planting them in rich soil. Uh, so, uh, but there are some grasses, other grasses that um, I can recommend. But just it's a you have to really think carefully. Um, just like you do any plant, any, you have to the right plant with the right place. So you can't ignore that uh, with the native plants. Now here's something from Grow Native. A juga is a very common ground cover, especially if you're dealing with dry shade, uh, as we do in, in the, the cities here, Kansas City, Lawrence. Um, a juga is very popular. So the suggested equivalents or alternatives from Grow Native were wild ginger and golden ragwort. So you can look at that and say, well, is that a, is that, do I just want a ground cover um, in my shady lot? Um, or do I need those blue purple blooms and that sort of uh, purplish leaf color? Wild ginger is a nice leaf, it's gorgeous, but its blooms are very understated. They're under the leaves and they're very dark and they're pollinated by flies. So they're not very showy. Golden ragwort on the right there um, does a nice thing, nice job of covering with its vegetation, its leaves, um, but it has tall yellow flowers. Do you want yellow in that spot that you're looking for? Um, so it's kind of, um, there are suggestions, there are native alternatives to the non-natives. Um, but once again, it's all, you know, it's about what you want aesthetically and what right plant, right place. Um, another suggestion uh, in the shrubs that we've got barberry um, all over the place, uh, which is not, you know, people sort of look down their noses at barberry, but it works in certain situations. Uh, a potential native that you could replace that with would be Virginia sweet spire, or at least general to this 
region, native to this region, um, but it might not hedge as well if you really want a tight hedge it, um, like barberry will give you. But it's a, a beautiful little plant, Virginia Sweet Spire, and does very well. Now here are some cultivars with close fitting natives. So over the pictures here show the natives of Delphiniums, Coreopsis, and Penstemon. Um, and if you go to online to look at garden centers or what they have, there's all kinds of cultivars of Delphiniums, Foxgloves, and Coreopsis. But if you want to go native, um, you have something very close. I mean, there's not, uh, we, we, there are native equivalents can, can, how can I say this, can, can substitute in quite well for the non-natives in this case. And these are things that are often available. These particular natives are often available in the garden center. So you can more easily go natives with some groups of plants than others. So cautionary tale for some people planting natives. So when I started out as a master gardener, 2011 is when I was a master gardener. And I thought, oh, we're gonna plant these native plants in this little spot that we were given as a class. Here, go plant stuff in this spot. And we're gonna go native, we're gonna go native. Well, we, none of us really knew what we were doing at the time. I certainly didn't. I mean, I knew about native plants. I knew their ecology. Just gonna put them in a garden, right? Well, these turned out to be a mistake. Horsetail, we're still trying to get rid of. Um, the spiderwort, I even planted in my yard, and I have to say it's often recommended, but it spreads. You know, um, so if you don't mind, you know, pulling it out every so often and keeping it in check, it's fine. Um, but if you don't want to spend that much time pulling it out, then you might um, have a cautionary tale. The other one was Jerusalem artichoke, and then the American bittersweet, which got a little out of hand. And that does happen when you plant things with your non-natives in a very well cared for garden, sometimes they can get out of hand. So you right plant, right place. Karen, we have a question. Yes. I think of barberry because of deer depredation. Do deer eat Virginia sweet spire? I don't know if Virginia sweet spire, I don't think I've seen it on the list of plants that are that deer do not prefer. Um, I don't think I've seen that. I'm not. I don't live in the country, so I don't know if the deer. I have not heard about it being a problem, but neither have I seen it on those lists that you can find about deer um, for deer eating the plants. Um, it does not have the thorns. So, if uh, if you're really looking for something that deer will not eat and you want that hedge, then barberries, kind of what you're looking for. The Virginia sweet spire does not have the thorns, um, but whether or not they're preferred by the deer, I don't know. And maybe somebody else does. Um, do put that in the chat. If you've had experience with Virginia sweet spire out where there's more deer. Uh, this is actually a picture of uh, where I've been trying to grow some natives in my yard. And I, like I said, I have a city lot. I've got a lot of shade. I get some, a few hours of sun in the morning um, on this particular garden and I keep trying, but what happens to um, some of my natives are, is they flop. I've got partial sun. Um, even though I don't amend the soil, the soil is better than you'd find out in the prairie. Um, I did have some cared for plants in there uh, and they just flop over. I tried planting Leatris and I tried planting um, some goldenrod and the milkweeds and they just flop over. Um, and so, and that, I don't like that. So I'm transitioning to try to find shorter, much shorter uh, native plants. So that can be a problem in your garden um, if you've got uh, good soil or not enough sun. I mean, these are prairie plants. A lot of these natives are prairie plants and they need a lot of sun. So- I did get a response. Yes. I have deer and sweet spire. I have never had a problem with the deer eating it. Great. That's good. So that's good to know. So Virginia sweet spire, and it is a lovely little shrub. Um, um, it does well in our gardens. It does well in my gardens, and it has a nice fall color. Uh, and like I said, it's sort of native-ish to this area. That's another term I've sort of 
brought up is there are certain things that are native native and there are native ours and then there's native-ish, which is sort of, we borrowed a little bit from maybe our neighbors to the east or neighbors to the south. Uh, so, uh, and, and include that in some plant lists. So, so go ahead and try try them, but do be careful. So here it is a picture of some of the things that are gen native plants, straight natives, that are most often available in most of your garden centers. You've got Monarda, you've got the butterfly milkweed, another milkweed, I believe that's Sarai, uh, the swamp milkweed, the woodland phlox, the echinaceas, the rudbeckias, um, culver's root. These are all natives that you can find in your garden store. So if you really want to try to go um, strictly native uh, and you're not ready to order from specialty greenhouses and specialty seed providers and plant providers, because it can be expensive, um, you can find these in your local garden centers most often. So the key though, with planting any of the mix of natives and non-natives is variety. You want variety. So variety of form, variety of color, variety of bloom time, variety of purpose. That's what's really going to bring, if you're interested in pollinators uh, and just interest throughout the year, variety is your key. So mix in uh, what works, mix in natives and non-natives um, to get a bunch of pollinators. Go ahead and plant um, native ours. Make sure that when you know, if you've got a slightly shady spot uh, or your soil is too rich, maybe try to find one of those dwarf varieties of a native plant. Uh, so that'll still bring the pollinators in, but it'll fit your garden better. Uh, if you've got the space and you've got all the sun in the world, go ahead and plant one of those really tall um, natives. Go ahead and plant Indian grass um, or one of the big silphiums if you've got the space for it. Uh, and I've got some resources for you too that I'll get to where you can find these sorts of plants. So for, for, I just wanna uh, define variety of purpose, what I mean by that. Um, your nectar plants, your host plants, and what I call your buffet plants for the birds. Um, anything that's gonna bring a lot of caterpillars around is gonna be great for the birds. So you want the nectar plants, the host plants, and the buffet plants. And if you're interested in birds, I put a link in here for the Jayhawk Audubon uh, group who has a list of plants specifically that benefit bird populations because they host a lot of caterpillars. And so there's the link for that. Um, and I will be sending the, I'll be sending this along uh, so that you, if you, so that you can have these links after the presentation. So, uh, to help everybody, um, if you're interested in planting natives, uh, I worked with uh, the Grassland Heritage Foundation and the Kansas Rural Center to come up with a guide for planting natives in Northeast Kansas. Um, and this guide takes on several forms. There's several brochures. All right. So this is the website that is a companion to the publication we put together. So, and there are several sections. You can pick up the brochures, the hard copy brochures at the Douglas County Extension Office. Um, but this is provi it's provided for you online, free downloads. So what we have in this guide is gardening with native plants, um, landscaping with native plants for bigger areas. And this is actually a picture of um, one of our demonstration gardens in Douglas County. Um, we've also got reconstructing prairie here um, restoring prairie, which means if you have a remnant on your land and you want to restore, um, restore that prairie. And then we've also got establishing native cropland borders and buffers. So we'll go to the gardening with natives. And did that switch? Can you see gardening with yes. native plants? Yes. Okay, great. So when you click on one of these, you can get the whole guide for download. So guide to gardening with native plants. And I'll show you some specific highlights of this in a minute. I won't go through the whole publication, but just to show you that you can go in and download this PDF. And what it's going to do is um, give you the reasons for native plants, uh, how to go ahead and plant them, climate conscious gardening, we've gotten boxes, where to go see plantings, um, how to go, ahead, go about defining your garden goals, um, and details on how to get rid of what you've got. Like say, if you wanna plant a, 
pollinate a garden in place of a lawn, we tell you how to do that. Uh, so I'll show you some highlights in a minute, but just know that you can go ahead and um, download that. So now I'm going to go to, so what we have here um, is a whole Excel spreadsheet um, that you can click on and manipulate. Download it for yourself. If you know how to use Excel, you can use it to create your own plant list. But these are plant recommendations uh, for specifically for this region. And what we've done here is divide it into annuals and perennials. We've recommended certain uh, species for shade. We've recommended grasses and shrubs. Um, and so you can go through this and have this be your own Excel file that you can use and manipulate and investigate these plants and take to a garden store or go online to order your um, native plants. So we've got recommendations for wetter areas, shady areas. We've got some plants that we like to borrow from out outside Northeast Kansas um, here. Uh, there's that Ozark witch hazel that I mentioned. Um, so that's available um, in the guide. So, and now, I'm uh, sorry for all the manipulation here, but um, I want to show you what is there. I'm going to go back to my screen here. Okay, also what you'll find um, are where to find plants and seeds. We have a list of providers and I'm not gonna go um, click on this again because it's taking a little bit too long, um, but um, local, regional, local and regional providers of seeds and plants you can find um, on this website. And also if you wanna go see what they look like, I mean, I really highly recommend that going to where you can see natives that are planted and see what they look like in gardens. How big do they get? Um, how do they bloom? When do they bloom? So we have a list here of where to go see native plants in public gardens. So I urge you to take advantage of that. Uh, and so I am going to go. We have a question. Yes. Where do we get this spreadsheet? It's, it's on that website. Uh, I will go back to that. So this link to the website, it's, it's basically, the website is Plant Native Kansas. So plantnativeks.org. And I will send that along so it can go out to uh, everybody. We can have that link um, provided for you. So Thank the, you. So no, it's plantnativeks.org is the website that has that spreadsheet on it. And to show you some things that are available in that guide that I didn't want to go through, we have a lot of advice boxes. Um, I went and interviewed a number of people who have been doing native gardening, um, whether it's just um, small native gardens or larger areas. And so Jill Kleinberg, one of our master gardeners was one of them, she has a whole front yard um, that she's turned into a meadow. And so I asked her for her advice on planting natives. And just to highlight here, one of the things I really liked about what she said about planting natives, and in this case, a, a meadow in front of her house, was don't be afraid to rearrange your meadow. I mean, you can treat the meadow um, as a garden. She likes, she's uh, an artist and she likes to go ahead and she got native seed, established her, took her about three years to establish a native meadow, but she still goes in and buys particular native plants that she wants to see right out her door for particular spots, uh, pops of color um, in, um, in different seasons. So she actually sort of designs her meadow, which I thought was a great little piece of advice. I really enjoyed that. So you'll find these sorts of things. Um, from Susan Rendell, who many of you may know, um, has a, a giant garden um, uh, just on the edge of Douglas County here, and we often go visit hers. Um, it's a, quite a mix of non-natives and natives, and she's been growing natives, um, gardening with natives for many, many years, and she has some uh, advice for what not to plant in a well-behaved native perennial garden, and that's sort of what we're all after, is a well-behaved native perennial garden. So we have little bits of, of advice um, throughout this guide. And there's just, again, um, we have the spreadsheet available uh, for, for you to manipulate and download and take to garden centers, uh, where to go see plants. 
and where to buy plants. So this is all in that guide, the plantnativeks.org, plant um, where you can find seeds. So we've got Kansas and regional sources of plants and seeds. And also I wanna mention that this guide is a work in progress. Um, so uh, I plan to continually update it with pro providers, um, particularly as there's more and more providers that are interested in prairie restoration and prairie reconstruction. Um, so we're trying to have sources uh, who are people who um, you can hire to apply herbicides or who or you, you can apply to, uh, you can actually hire to mow large areas. Uh, that's a, a service that's often, or to burn. Um, so a lot of management activities with restoration and reconstruction, and we want to provide a list of services. So this whole guide is going to be continually updated. Uh, we hope, so if you have any specific, once you go in there and you find what's useful and what's not useful, or you want to see other information in the guide, please do let me know. And I hope to update the website for this um, regularly. Uh, so um, at this point, I'll take any questions or talk about um, some of my favorites for natives, if anybody's interested in that. And I'll stop my screen share so I can maybe see some people uh, and talk to them and answer questions. I'd love to hear about your favorites. Ah, okay. So I did uh, write down my favorites, although I'm not a good photographer, I have to say. I'm trying, I'm learning, um, but I don't have like a whole pot of file of good photographs. Um, but some of my favorites, I'll start with a ground cover. And that's another thing I recommend when planting natives, um, where natives are very useful, is the, a layering effect. Um, so if you wanna reduce your weeds, especially when you're planting, in uh, your backyard, your front yard, you're not dealing with a, a, a prairie, um, most of your soil um, is gonna be somewhat amended and somewhat friendly um, for plants. So a layering works. So start with a, starting with a ground cover and then your shorter plants and then your medium type plants. And then if you have room and space, the really tall ones. And that really keeps down the weeds and it allows for uh, bloom times throughout the season. Uh, and uh, far less weeding and mulching. So um, starting with the ground cover, one of my favorites is Rose Verbena. Beautiful pink flower. And it, and it can be, um, it can spread, it can spread, but you know, you know, in parts of my garden, it only, you know, it only gets about uh, this tall. I like it to, it can go ahead and cover as much ground as it wants. And then I'll just plant other plants in it. So I love Rose Verbena. Um, Another one I like is that Pacara, it's Pacara obovado. It was a ground cell I had a picture of with that. In place of a juga, you can um, plant this rag, this ground cell. And it's, it's about, it gets up to maybe 10, maybe 12 inches tall, depending on your soil. Um, bright yellow flower, nice ground cover. It's been slower to spread than I wanted. I wanted it to spread. Um, so it's not really aggressive but it kind of is slow to spread in clay soil, but that might be just the perfect balance. Um, not too aggressive, but does spread. Um, so that's another, uh, and it's good in shade, dry shade, um, that ground cell is good. I've been trying to grow sedges. Um, there are some little sedges, Carex ebernia, and Carex, it's, um, white tinge sedge, I can't quite remember the name of the, the scientific name of that, uh, or oak sedge, um, the smaller sedges that will do well um, in a little bit of drier shade, they don't need as wet. Um, and another one for really sunny spots, really sunny dry spots are pussytoes, Antonaria neglecta. Um, I really enjoy that for a ground cover and that spread really nicely. So those are my ground cover um, my grasses that I really will recommend are little blue stem, blue grandma grass, Budalua grassless, and prairie drop seed, um, Sprobus heterolepis. It's a big mounding grass. Well, not big. I mean, it only gets maybe the vegetation maybe gets a foot tall, and then it's got some blooming stalks. But it's this nice, lovely mounded grass. And you, uh, Lynn, did you want me to? Well, yeah, not till now, though. 
uh, one person says, great presentation. And then which natives are best for honeybees? Uh, well, actually, um, I, I can't pick anything in particular. Um, most of them are going to be good. The ones in terms of um, for bee pollination, uh, the plants with that are tubular are often really good for bees. The platform plants that like Echinacea and Rutabecchia, um, I see bees at too and butterflies and moths, but the tubular ones are very specific um, to a lot of bees. So that change in form with having the penstemons, uh, for example, are really good for um, bees if you want a variety um, of bees, particularly the bigger ones, the honeybees, bumblebees, things like that. They really like those tubular flowers. So I recommend planting some of those. Um, let's see, what else do I like? Uh, I honestly have not had a lot of luck with some of the mid-range plants uh, because I don't have enough sun. Uh, and they get either really leggy and then fall over or they just don't thrive because I just don't have that prairie sun in my city lot. Um, so I do have difficulty with that and I'm still experimenting uh, with that. Uh, I do, uh, some of the shade ones I mentioned was Pacara uh, can do well. Uh, my Virginia Sweet Spire um, actually can handle uh, partial shade, but it gets beaten by the afternoon sun. Um, that's one thing that I, I well, one of the reasons I've been switching over to natives a little bit is I have uh, part of my yard is mostly in shade, except it gets blasted by that Kansas afternoon sun. And there aren't a lot of non-natives that can really handle that. If I want a low maintenance garden, I mean, I could be out there watering every day these, the, 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 these prima donna plants, but I don't want to do that. So I've been trying to switch to that because some of the natives can really handle that afternoon sun. Uh, so I've been trying to switch over there and the pussy toes is one that's been doing really well. Um, Virginia sweet spire has been doing really well there. Um, oh, Virginia bluebells, because um, they're, they're out earlier in the spring. So I don't have to worry about them so much in the summer sun. Uh, shrubs, um, I've got golden currant. Um, I've Planted, I want to find an Eastern Wahoo. I don't know, I just love the name. And it's a native shrub um, in, along our rivers, um, along, around the Caw River. They planted a lot of those for restoring the river banks. Um, so I'm trying to grow that in my yard, Eastern Wahoo. Um, these sorts of native shrubs, I, tend, I generally have to special order um, from native plant nurseries. And when I order from native plant nurseries, one thing I recommend is that if you're going to order plants, uh, whether uh, potted plants, um, try to order as locally as you can. Uh, a plant that's, uh, you know, a nursery in Oregon or in Wisconsin may have a lot of native plants to sell, um, but you want a plant stock that's from as close to here as possible. So more of a regional provider because um, these plants are gonna be adapted to our conditions as opposed to um, growing in Oregon or Wisconsin. So I recommend trying to get your seed source and your plant source from um, a regional provider um, where you'd have better luck. I have two more comments. One's uh, feedback, thank you so much. I am looking to expand my little native patches into two acres. And this was very helpful, especially the reference to the website. And one more question, is there a goldenrod that you recommend? Oh, goldenrod is kind of tough. It's a great for pollinators, all kinds of pollinators. Um, but depending on where, if you've got uh, a lot of sun and you've got the space um, to put a really tall plant in um, either in the center of a big plot or in the background um, and, you, and you can plant a bunch of stuff around it and you've got the space um, to handle it, the uh, rigid goldenrod 
is a lovely, it's got very unique leaves. Um, they're a little bit stouter than some of the other goldenrods. Um, and, it, and the bloom is, is a little more flat top, the bloom as opposed to the panicle uh, shape. And so I really like that, but it's a big, it can get really big. Uh, and I tried it in my yard and it just sort of flopped over. So if you've got the space, I recommend um, Solidago rigida. The same with tall goldenrod. Um, that can get a bit floppy unless you've got the space and the sun. And that's the problem with a lot of the goldenrods. There is a goldenrod that does better in a little bit of shade. I'm trying to remember the name of it. I think it's... No, I'm not gonna, I'll tell you wrong if I, if I don't um, get it right. I will send that in some notes. It's a, more of a, a goldenrod that grows in the, the shade if you want that little bit of yellow, um, but it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not like the other goldenrods, it's very understated. So uh, Missouri goldenrod um, is another one that's a little bit shorter. So the Canada goldenrod, um, Missouri, gold, Missouri goldenrod, a little bit shorter, um, but you might find that they spread. And that's the problem with some of the goldenrods is they can be um, aggressive. Um, not so that you can't keep on top of it if you want to, uh, but they can be a little bit aggressive. That's all the questions we have. Okay, well, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody needs to, wants to verbally shout one out. Uh, Sharon? Yes. My name is Reggie. I'm interested in uh, the goldenrod. Which goldenrod is the actual native goldenrod? Because I, I, I learned that goldenrod is used medicinally too. And I think that would be good something to have around for wounds. There are actually um, several native goldenrods. So um, the, the one I mentioned, Solidago rigida, is a native, Solidago missouriensis, or Missouri, missouriensis is a native. Um, the tall goldenrod, uh, Solidago altissimum, I believe is the name. These are all natives. Um, so there are many, many different kinds of um, Solidagos. And there's a lot of, uh, there, well, I shouldn't say a lot of, um, there are some cultivars, um, native bars of the goldenrods also. Um, that you can find, but there are many different kinds of natives. And uh, I don't have my spreadsheet in front of me and I, uh, to, to list the ones that are recommended for this region. It'll be in that spreadsheet I showed. Uh, but one of okay. the things about the goldenrod uh, is that's really popular uh, for native plant sales. So one thing that you all might do is there's native plant sales in the region. So that um, you all have um, over in Wyandotte County have a native plant sale, if I remember correctly. Um, and there's native plant sales over the border of Missouri. There's native plant sales here in Kansas and Douglas County from a number of organizations. And that is often a, a great place to get, in fact, I highly recommend getting your plants, your native plants that, that way, because you can actually um, talk with people who are selling the plants about how they work in the gardens. Um, these plants are generally ordered. Uh, most, of, most of the people ordering, doing plant sales order from regional producers of native plants. And they have a much greater variety at the native plant sales than they do in the garden centers. Uh, so I would highly recommend visiting, whether it's gonna be virtually this year or in person, the native plant sales, because they'll have a great variety. Um, the people who are doing the plant sales know how they perform in the gardens. And it's a, it, it's a great, much greater variety than you'll find in the native, in the garden centers. Thank you. And I have one more question. Um, we, we have a, a vegetable garden over here, a community garden. And I'm interested in uh, native plants or flowers that could be planted in our, our vegetable garden to help with insect control. Uh, are there flowers that we can plant in and around our garden that will help dissuade hmm. uh, insects that eat our, our, our vegetables 
and our vegetables are that will draw, that will attract uh, insects that will, you know, eat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I honestly, that's a really great question and very interesting. I don't know of native plants that would specifically repel um, particular insects, um, but any native plants that you can plant around your garden are going to bring in beneficial insects. Um, and that's what's reckoned when um, there's a lot of agricultural research, particularly those, those cropland borders um, that I spoke about. And then what's becoming a little bit more popular or being encouraged is uh, planting pollinator gardens next to larger production gardens, like a community garden. Um, right. And um, so just on one end or at least somewhat nearby because the benefits of pollination um, are just fantastic. Um, there's been some work um, down south. I was at a presentation the other day, it was out of Mississippi, I think, and they were um, talking about um, how much more production of their melon crops were, were uh, because they had pollinator gardens. Near their, their, near their production melon gardens. Um, so there's been a lot of work recently on putting pollinator gardens near vegetable production gardens um, and the benefits of the pollinators um, that bring to it. Now, as opposed for repelling though, I, have, I don't have any information on that. I haven't heard of anything that's particularly good for repelling insects. Okay, well, you gave me some good information that I can use, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We have a few more comments. Have have you ever grown senna, S-E-N-N-A, -N -N and if so, is it invasive? We have senna in our demonstration garden and it has behaved very nicely. <laughs> it has, has done well. Um, we have not had an issue with it and we do have um, amended soil in those demonstration gardens. Um, it can get pretty tall though. Um, but I have not found it to be invasive in a garden. Um, yeah. One thing you might do um, is put in the chat for future references if everybody puts their own favorite native plant in the chat, um, then um, that would be something that people could see. Sure. Um, there's a few more questions. There's a, there, there's a plant that are alternative hosts for predatory insects I have to look up a talk I heard last year with suggestions. This is from Nancy Chapman. Okay. Um, so maybe bringing in, um, yeah, like I said, I don't know any specific plants, but native plants in general are gonna bring in not only the pollinators, but also the predators. And she said um, slender mountain mint is one great plant for gardens. Ah, that's one plant I have found. Remember, I said I had trouble getting the sort of taller native plants that aren't, aren't ground covers, but has some height to them in my garden uh, with the partial sun. And slender mountain mint is one that I have been able to grow. And it only gets maybe a foot high, foot and a half high, a slender mountain mint. And it's just lovely to smell whenever you bump into it. So yeah, that's a great suggestion of Slender Mountain Mint. Another question. Do native ours live as long as the native? Is this an issue to consider? Um, in looking at the research from natives versus native ours, I have not seen that as a concern. Um, I, have not, I have not seen any work done comparing um, natives and native ours. Most people are concerned about what pollinators and how many pollinators are visiting. One thing that you might, if you're interested in the comparison of natives to non-natives, um, there's some really great work being done out of Oregon State. They actually have research plots that are now, uh, they're spending, the graduate students there are spending a great deal of time sampling the insects that are visiting and identifying all the insects that are visiting the natives versus non-natives. And they have an ongoing blog um, where they, they regularly post their information. And another interesting thing that they're doing is they're looking at the uh, intersection of the native plants that pollinators prefer 
intersecting with the native plants that gardeners prefer and seeing what the overlap is. And the last time I looked at the blog, when I looked at that is like, there, there wasn't as much overlap as I would have anticipated. There were a couple plants, at least out in Oregon, where pollinators and gardeners like the same plant, <laughs> but there isn't as much overlap as you would um, expect. But there's just some interesting research going on um, out there with natives and native ours. So you might wanna follow them if you're interested. And of course, a lot of people, if Doug Tallamy does a lot of work on that too, uh, out of Delaware, is doing a lot of work on natives versus non-natives. And he's got several books um, on planting natives. We have one more uh, favorite natives from Carol Fowler. Various coneflowers, love them all. Yeah, the plant breeders love the coneflowers too, as you can tell with all kinds of weird shapes and sizes and colors um, of those echinaceas. But the, the best thing to do, of course, is plant as much as possible <laughs> and as much variety as possible. Um, and that'll bring, every, that'll bring all the pollinators in. And Deb Sweeten, our uh, Zoom coordinator, has a question for you. So Sharon, early on, uh, earlier you mentioned something about uh, the birds and the, the mm -hmm. you gave us a link for more information on that if we want, we're interested in also uh, planning for birds. But you mentioned something about um, plant a buffet for birds. And it sounded to me like it was suggesting that we actually plant with the intent for caterpillars to be born so that the birds can eat them. Yes. And so I'm kind of, I plant for the, for the butterfly. Well, I have do both birds and butterflies, but I was like, oh, I, I got to protect my caterpillars from the birds eating them all. So is, I'm concerned, is, is there a concern about the, the birds eating all the caterpillars or do they just reach a certain point to where it's like, ah, okay, we're full, we're not gonna, well, all the rest of these caterpillars will be fine. Well, the thing is, is we're, we're seeing right now um, uh, that we, we're needing to bolster the population of our pollinators and our birds. Um, so we're, we're sort of caught where we are diversity, uh, plant diversity, insect diversity, bird diversity is, is taking tremendous nosedives um, these days. And so in an attempt to support all these populations, uh, that's where the variety comes from. It's because it takes, I forget what the statistic is, uh, it's just one chickadee to feed the little chick is a ton, is just an enormous amount of caterpillars. Um, so they need as many caterpillars as they can get. But if you're concerned about having enough for the birds and having um, enough caterpillars to survive, to grow up to be butterflies and moths, one thing you might do is to take a more holistic view and not just think, not just think about your yard and what you want, but if you look at your whole neighborhood. Um, so for instance, one of the best things you can plant for caterpillars for as bird food are oak trees. Um, Doug Tallamy has done research on this and shows that the oak tree is a phenomenal plant uh, for caterpillars, supports all kinds of caterpillars and therefore supports um, bird populations. So um, how many oak trees do you have in your neighborhood? One way, it's interesting to look, if you look, if I look out my window here, like I said, I live in the city, um, I don't have a water feature in my yard, but my next door neighbor does. Um, so there's a water feature that will help support um, bird populations. For instance, I have a giant oak tree in my yard. So I'm feeding birds with the caterpillars there. And then in my own yard where I don't have a lot of room, I'm planting these herbaceous perennials and shrubs. Um, and I'm planting berry shrubs like golden currants for the birds. And I have hopes of eventually having a gooseberry pie, but I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, but I've got gooseberries and I've got a dwarf service berry. So there's another way to support the birds uh, with the berries that these grow. And then my herbaceous pollinator plants, my herbaceous uh, native plants um, for the butterflies and the bees and whatnot. Um, so, if, but if you think about what your neighbors have, what might be in 
a, a short view of your backyard or front yard, you can think of that as maybe an ecosystem and that'll help have you plant, plan your own yard um, when you think about what everybody else has. I, I don't know if that, does that help? If you think about your yard as a large piece of an ecosystem, you can kind of think about what's lacking um, and what needs to support different populations, whether it's your birds or your pollinators. Yes, that's a very good explanation. I like that, looking at the whole environment, the whole ecosystem within a broader area than just my own. So, um, and that, that definitely helps ease my concern about right. how to preserve the caterpillars. Thank you. And then you can, you can fill in the holes or realize that, you know, I really don't want to mess with the water feature. So thank goodness my neighbor has one. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so. Well, it's 12.50 and we can still entertain a few more comments and questions. Um, one was, I love milkweeds. Another, a chickadee study found a clutch needs 6,000 plus caterpillars in a two, two weeks to fledging. Butterflies lay tons of eggs, some will survive. Mm -hmm. Are there native berry producing viburnums? You know, I'm not sure, viburnums, I'm trying to think what um, prefers viburnums. I know the, my viburnum in my yard, it's, a, it's a, probably the most valuable thing about it is shelter um, for the birds. They love to hide there. In fact, I saw a um, sharp shin hawk trying to dive through my viburnum the other day, looking for the little birds um, that were sheltering in my viburnum. Um, whether the fruits of the vi viburnum are preferred by, I don't know, maybe somebody else else out there knows if there's particular um, fruits of the viburnum that the birds um, like. I do know it is a recommended plant in the Audubon bird list. They do recommend a viburnum. I think it's called the, the black haw viburnum. I think yeah. it's the one that they recommend is the black yeah. haw viburnum for birds. Yeah, Carol Fowler just wrote that the black oh. hawk viburnum produces nice berries bird stripped it black mm -hmm. hawk not hawk or black haw h-a-w yep that is Nancy, the one that audubon recommends right and nancy chapman said bird parents prefer to fly no more than 150 feet to find hatchling food caterpillars 50 feet is better 95 percent of hatchlings seek caterpillars even if the adult eats the seeds. That's one of the things you'll find on the, the Audubon site in terms of is thinking about seasonality for bird populations in terms of what they're eating when um, and when they're here um, on their migration. Um, and once again, so what, what, when we think about plant, planting plants to support um, insect populations and bird populations. Again, it's all about variety. It's all about different times of blooming and what sorts of uh, support they're gonna give. Is it berries for the birds? Is it caterpillars for the birds? Is it egg laying spots? Is it food for caterpillars? So the real key is, is variety, um, like variety of form, variety of color, uh, variety of food source, a variety of bloom time. Um, is going to make your yard the most habit, be a habitat essentially for a whole range of creatures. We won't talk about rabbits and squirrels, but. Well, unless there are any more questions, I'll move to the end of our presentation. Thank you, Sharon, for an excellent presentation. I'll go ahead and put in the chat thing now that I've, I've got it up here on um, the website, right there in the chat. Um, and I will send the slides to you um, with those links. That will be very helpful. Thank you very much.